side of your life is any hood. For those of you who cannot wait and love daddyhood, please head over to our Patreon. We have exclusive access to episodes. We have early access to episodes and we have behind the scenes footage. Head on over there, sign up, be part of the exclusive daddyhood group and join us over there. Welcome back to daddyhood. I'm on my path to parenthood today. I'm so excited to have JC Marie with me. Thank Hello. you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored. Oh my gosh. I feel like I am I have so many questions to ask you just about advice because what I'm doing here is about to open me up to a lot of public attention on my path to parenthood. Mm-hmm. And you're no stranger to that. So Not at all. Before we get into the questions though, I am working on one thing and that is my dad jokes. So I love it. You will entertain me. <laughs> I would love to. Here we go. JC, why did the Scarecrow win an award? Why? Because he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> Round of applause. So proud of that Scarecrow. <laughs> my husband just, I forget, I'm forgetting the joke, but my husband just made a joke yesterday and he was like, that was a really good dad joke. And I was like, yeah. You're you're on the path. <laughs> you are. <laughs> we're practicing. Yeah, we're, exactly. we're doing our best. I want to. I want to be the dad that like my kid eye rolls for sure several times a day. Yeah, you got to be a little bit cringy to your kids. Uh, totally. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, a little bit about you. You are 25 years old. 29. 29. Why does it say 25? <laughs> we just did this math. I should have known. Damn it. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're 29 years old. Yes. You were born in Arizona mm-hmm. and then moved to LA. Yes. So you've always had great weather around you. It's true. I've been so spoiled my entire life. I'm such a baby. In any cold weather, once it drops below 50, I'm not okay. Yeah. LA's made me soft too. I grew up in Illinois and now all of a sudden like when it gets below 60, I'm like, oh, this is chilly. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I need my parka. Yeah. So you have your husband and you also have your red toy poodle which you just told me the name. Yeah, Lady. Oh, so She's cute. the cutest little angel. And you started off your career in photography and videography, mm-hmm. and then now you transition more into lifestyle content sharing, in which we're about to get all into. Yes. Because obviously this is falls under that umbrella of content sharing. Um, so just tell me how, one, you transitioned out of photography and videography into more of this raw, real storytelling and also just really important work. Yeah, it's so interesting. I have done photography since I was in high school, really since I was in middle school. I've just been obsessed with it. And I was always, I wasn't very like forward facing on social media. You know, in high school, I would just do, I would shoot photos of my friends or people and I would post those. And then kind of towards the end of high school, when I was probably 18 ish, um, I started posting more content of me and like Mm -hmm. my life and my travels along with my photography. And I started seeing that that actually was getting more attention and just people were loving the more, I I don't know if you'd call it real, but just my life. And I was like, that's so interesting to me because at that time, I mean, that was 10 years ago. And so there weren't really social media influencers at the time. I don't know. I didn't really know that existed. So I remember a brand reached out to me. They're like, "Uh, we want you to like photograph this like with you in it. And, And I was like, with me because I've always been behind the camera. I was like, okay. Yeah. So then I started posting more of that. And yeah, it was just very well received. And it kind of just slowly transitioned into like me sharing my life and my travels and what I'm up to, my, me and my husband, all of it. And so. now you're sharing your fertility journey and you're spe- more specifically your journey with IVF. Yes. Um, I mean, I can relate a little bit in the fact that there's, a, I know for certain there's a lot that goes into that decision of being so open and vulnerable and transparent. You know, how did that get started, specifically the IVF and your family building, you know, content? Yeah. Um, I didn't know if I would ever share that part of my life. I've always been quite an open book and just kind of laid it all out on the table and shared whatever on social media without thinking too much into it. But Um, we knew that we might struggle a little bit with getting pregnant because my husband had childhood cancer. And so he had done chemotherapy and we were, we just didn't know if that would be like an issue for us. So, um, I had been like, I'm not gonna, you know, I don't need to tell everyone, Hey, I'm trying to get pregnant, but maybe if I do struggle with it, I had it in the back of my mind, maybe I would open up about it just because anyone who 
it's not super common, but anyone who I have seen open up, it really like touched me that they would share something so personal and vulnerable. And so I was open to it. Um, and I was like, if it takes me like a year and a half to get pregnant, maybe I would talk about how that was hard, you know, yeah. four years later, I'm like, okay, now we're talking You're like, about now it. this is really hard. Yeah. I'm like, now this is really hard. And now we're really talking about it. But, um, yeah, I did. Um, are you familiar with IUI? Yes. Okay. But ish. Yes, I would let, so, let you elaborate for those out there. Okay, so IUI is, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to go into like the, the depths of it, but it's it's um, a bit easier. It's a bit cheaper. It's less invasive, I will say, yeah. than IVF. So um, IUI is basically where they're taking sperm and like putting it up in the right place right. to hopefully yep. make something happen. So my husband and I did three IUIs, which is what they my doctor recommended, um, and none of them took, and that was a few summers ago. And I think I had said on social media, like, oh, we're doing some fertility stuff, but I was pretty vague and I didn't really get into it. I actually filmed all of it and then I just could not bring myself to post it because it was so much harder than I expected when all of them failed. I just thought they would work. And I was like excited to like tell this happy story. And then I was like, it's not happy anymore. And it's so hard that I don't feel comfortable. So I actually, I, I did tell people like we've been going through some fertility stuff, but I, I just didn't really give details. And then I was like, maybe I will share IVF when we do it. Um, And then we started doing IVF and I was like, oh, this is actually really hard too. Like, I don't know. So I was filming all of it and I just, something in my gut, I was like, I just always lead by intuition. I feel like, like what I feel is right when I'm posting, what I feel good about, what I don't feel good about. And with IVF, I had this deep feeling like, I just have to share this. Like I, I, and I want to, I want to share this journey with people, like really whether or not it is successful. I just feel like people just have no idea what goes into this a lot of times. So yeah, I kind of committed to posting and then in the midst of it, I, we can get into all this, but I did have a failed transfer and stuff. And and then I, and I hadn't posted in real time yet. I was just kind of banking up. And then when that failed, I was like, maybe I won't like, this is so hard, but I, Mm. I really tried to commit to myself. Like, I just want to, I just want to share this. So luckily, obviously yeah, it all worked out in the end, but yeah. Well, I can tell you this too, just, and obviously we've, we have a lot to get into, but I'm not doing any of this in real time either. That's why I'm banking a lot of the episodes. I'm also talking through. So like, there's definitely going to be people out there being like, your timeline doesn't make sense. I'm like, it's intentional because I want to protect my emotional and also my family like this and my husband too. So I think that's one of my first questions is I don't want to gloss over the fact that your husband had childhood cancer. So going into fertility, did he get tested? Was that something that was on your radar is is sperm testing and seeing where his numbers were along with your numbers? Yeah. So it was on our radar, but we were like, let's try on our own for a little bit and we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. And then if we're feeling like there's an issue, we'll go in. So we had heard, which there is no right timeline. And this is what I've learned is if like, I almost, I don't wish that we would have gone in sooner, but like, I feel like we could have, I feel like when we first got married, we could have gone in and said, what's, you know, we just got married very young. And so we're like, well, we don't want kids for a little bit anyway. So we'll deal with that when it comes anyway. Um, but we did, we did just try naturally for like a year or a year and a half, I think even. And then we went to the doctor and got his sperm tested and, um, they were like, yeah, the morphology, it was the morphology, the shape of the sperm mm-hmm. was low or I don't know the correct term, but that was our issue specifically. Yeah. Um, and so they were like, IUI could help because they're going to put a bunch of sperm and like, you know maybe a good shaped one would make its way. Yeah. Um, but they were, they had always been, the doctors had said to us pretty much IVF would be something that could actually like correct this issue. So I did have a lot of faith in IVF just based on my doctors, um, what they said, but yeah, that was kind of our only diagnosis, I guess you could say. Yeah. Well, when you hear the word fertility, you don't, and I can just say this from my experience and I'm sure yours is similar. You don't think of like sperm right away. Like when you hear fertility, you more think of eggs and women and cycle and unfairly all of the pressure is put on the the women in fertility. And when I went in to get my sperm tested, 
they came back and they told my partner his first and they're like 55 million sperm per year, like, and went all crazy. And they came to me and I now know the correct way to tell this story because my doctor was just on and he said, you had four and they were barely alive. Like they were barely moving. The motility of your sperm was really low. So I had okay. like no swimmer. I had four sperm and only one was moving. The three were just mm. like not moving. And it was, there were so many contributing factors in my case. But once again, I had to go through six months of what essentially is like sperm rehabilitation. Mm. And, you know, I would have loved to know that because I like work out. I pride myself on being healthy. Right. But then you get these numbers and they're sort of shocking. And you're like, wow, I wish I would have known. What does that entail? The like rehabilitation? Sorry if you've already shared all this. No, but. you're fine. Um, For me, he sat me down and he's like, hey, so, and immediately my, I was like sort of caught off guard. I was like, what does this mean? And he goes, well, are you taking testosterone? And my answer is yes. And he said, are you working out more than four or five times a week? And I, my answer is yes. Are you doing saunas or steam rooms? My answer is yes. Mm. Are you taking baths or hot tubs? My answer was yes. And he's like, are you riding the Peloton or the bike? And I was like, yes. All wow. of those contribute to um, your sperm count and the levels. So immediately I was like, oh, I'm doing every single one. So we, uh, I started taking you know, some prenatal vitam vitamins, mm -hmm. making some lifestyle changes. And within three months, my results were starting to trend up. And by six months, I was able to have good enough results to freeze. Oh, that's amazing. So it was like a good story eventually. Yeah. But I think also one that I want to talk about on numerous occasions because not a lot of people talk about sperm. Yeah. And it feels like weird. Like I had a sperm expert on in, in Legacy Sperm, this at-home sperm testing kit that I think is so cool, especially for gay men, because it can be intimidating to go into a clinic mm -hmm. knowing what knowing what you're walking into that yeah. room to do um, to, for people to talk about. Because nobody nobody talks about the sperm count. It's always on. It is it, always. The pressure is always on the women. I would notice that whenever I would. I think before I had shared kind of our you know, our whole journey, people would always be like, Oh, so what's the pro like they would always pin it on me. It's like, Said, what's your problem? Yeah. So what's the problem wow. with you? Like, why can't you? And I'm like, you know, and not to pin it on my husband, but I'm like, my results have been normal. It's yeah. yeah. Male factor infertility is real and common. And yeah. yeah. So I, I obviously know like the birds and the bees and what happens and goes down, mm -hmm. but like, can you walk me through at what point did you guys look at each other and say like, Hey, we need help with this and we need to switch it up or change what we're doing because it's not working? Yeah. I mean, we, I like I had mentioned, we kind of just tried naturally and we we're like, we got it, obviously. Like, it's been a year and a half, probably something's up. So we did the testing. Once we found that that result out, it honestly was kind of comforting. It was really good to get information. Yeah. And then we did the IUIs, but then none of those worked. And then okay. I was always just holding on to the hope of IVF because I'm like, well, that's kind of maybe our answer. Yep. Um, and we actually waited quite a while. So we waited two years between doing IUIs and doing IVF mm -hmm. um, because it was so emotionally taxing. It really shocked me how just constantly trying to get pregnant and constantly having it on your mind and constantly testing and it being negative and then trying new things and it not working. And I was doing acupuncture and drinking like, you know, these herbal teas and doing all this stuff. And I'm just like, I I'm over this. Like I cannot... I really made a commitment to myself after doing our IUIs. And to be fair, I was still, I felt like young to where it's like, I felt like I had a little bit of time and I just was telling myself like, I need to still live a life. Yeah. I can't literally just be doing this 24 seven. It's not good for me. It adds stress. And then people are like, the worst thing for fertility is stress. And I'm like, yeah. well, I'm stressed. Yeah. So this is not, anyway, so we took like two full years off in the sense of just not doing actively doing fertility treatments or actively like trying new, you know, new things. And then at the start of last year, we were like, okay, we think we feel ready. And I'm really happy that we listened to ourselves. And my husband was very just like, you know, I guess respectful and like, this is going to be a lot of work for you to be doing all these shots and stuff. So like whenever you're ready, I'm ready, but I'm not going to yeah. push it, you know? And we both felt comfortable. Um, we just waited for the timeline that felt good. And then we started IVF. Yeah. I mean, I, I obviously have seen your TikToks and your videos of you in front of the camera, mm -hmm. injecting yourself with medication, mm -hmm. even the one with your dad and like getting ready. So 
I think I, I really, cause stress is a big factor. I know that for, for women, especially who was your support system outside of your family and, and your husband? Was there anybody you leaned on? Was there other influencers or celebrities that were open about this, that you were like diving in and consuming their information about this? Or what did that look like for you? Yeah. Anyone that shares publicly about IVF, I, I did search, I would like search for IVF vlogs or things. Um, and honestly, anyone who talks about it publicly, I was so grateful for because it's just like, makes you feel like yeah. not like you're going through something completely alone. Um, are you familiar with Desi Perkins? She's a YouTuber. No. Okay. She okay. shared her whole, this was honestly a while. It was a few years ago, but, um, she did a pretty in-depth YouTube series on her IVF journey Yep. and I watched that and it, I was really touched by, it. I really loved it. And it was, um, she just gave a lot of insight. I did. I also did a YouTube series. I was really inspired by her. Um, but I, I feel like mine was even less detailed. Like she really went into all of the stuff and I really, really appreciated it. Yeah. And I think that that is part of what motivated me to share as well is just like seeing how much that impacted me and being like, you know, could, could me sharing my experience possibly do the same for someone else, then it would be worth it. So um, yeah, I consumed a lot of IVF content. I will say it was almost at one point I was like, I had to stop because I was so, yeah. everyone's journey is so different. So yep. I was consuming all this content and they'd be like, we got, we retrieved 35 eggs. And then when I did mine, I retrieved like 12 and I was like, I feel like that's low. And then anyway, my doctor kept being like, don't compare, don't compare. Yeah. Everyone's really different. Yeah. And then my results ended up being awesome. And the embryos we got were awesome. And I was just like, okay. It's awesome to consume people's content, right. but then you don't want to get in the weeds of comparing numbers and yeah. really specific details. Guilty. Yeah. I mean, same with us. We did the same thing. Mm -hmm. We had 22 eggs. We split 11 and 11, and then we only had three embryos at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I, I even say that. I was like, we only had. I was like, I know people who have had 22 eggs and had zero embryos at right. the end. So like, I'm very grateful and blessed to have that. But yeah, the comparing thing is very real in this. Mm -hmm. Um. But one thing that I had noticed in my journey and what led me into the decision to do daddyhood in the first place is such an isolating feeling because it's sort of in that sweet spot of like awkward to talk to your parents about who have normally been your, you know, support system. And also there's only so much pressure and support you can get from your partner where you like don't want that to become your whole identity of your relationship of like talking about this. Mm -hmm. So it, it just, that was like the end goal for me too. I was like, okay, there's a stigma around this. There's a shame around this as an isolating feeling. Mm -hmm. I need to talk about this. I think it's going to be healthy. And it has been so healthy for me to like just digest this and sort of like word vomit with my doctor and my lawyer and all the teams that, and people that have helped me. So it's just, it's, I, I imagine that is similar with, with you too. It's just like, there has to be some sort of therapy in this. Totally. And I almost feel like even if someone's not a content creator, I'm like, I really, I loved be setting up my camera and just talking. I would talk for 30 minutes and be like, here's how I'm feeling. Like, yeah. I'm happy about this. I'm annoyed about this. This is super frustrating. Da, 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 da. And again, I was kind of creating a YouTube series out of it, but also yeah. I didn't put like there was a ton I just cut out, but I was grateful to have the space to just like yeah. word vomit and talk about my feelings somewhere. A digital diary. Yeah. I like I I have records. I mean, I have records of that. I also have, like physically have written down parts of our experience that I wanted to make sure like, you know, I touched on and I came yeah. back to. So I don't know. I mean, it's just and then there's like all of a sudden I have this platform. I'm like, oh, this is what I was meant to do. So then I just had that like, ah, I was like, this can be my next project. So for you coming out of, you know, the digital creator photography space, how have you sort of used those skills now into the IVF, the fertility, you know, journey and process and this platform that you have? I think I've always loved telling stories in a beautiful way. That's, you know, just been my, I mean, that's how I've honestly made my living for 10 years is just like telling a story of going on a trip and yep. kind of showing it through beautiful imagery or videos. And my husband's really talented at um, filmmaking. And so it was actually a really cool and healing process to go through IVF um, and document it mm -hmm. and share it in a bit of an artistic way, I guess you could say, um, or just like telling our story in a way that 
yeah, it felt like we were putting a little creativity. I don't know how to explain it, but just kind of, um, meshing something really hard that we went through with being able to showcase that through what we love to do, which is photo and video. And it really shocked me the response truly. I mean, I knew people would be nice. I was like, Oh, you know, hopefully this will be well received. But I was just shocked at how like emotional other people got, um, being like, I'm just sobbing watching these videos. And I'm like, really? Like, I mean, I was crying making them because it's me, but I didn't realize like how much it would actually affect other people too. And so that was really, really amazing. Yeah. And you don't, and until I started talking more openly with my friends and family about this, about this project specifically, I didn't realize how many questions they had. Yeah. Because there's so many misconceptions. There's so many like myths and, and untrue statements about fertility in general that it's like intimidating for people to like really break in and get into. And they don't, I, that was a super common comment I got on my videos too, was like, I had no idea IVF was this intense. They're like, I, you know, I knew people did IVF, but I didn't know it was like this because yeah. over the span of what I was sharing, you know, condensed was like seven months or like eight months of my life. Right. And it just was in like a quick, you know, a few quick videos. Yep. And like people were, I think, shocked by just how much medication, just how yeah. many appointments, all of it. Yeah. And so that was good to, I guess, have that, have people's eyes open to that as well. Yeah. So I want to walk through because m- our processes are similar but different in many yeah. ways. Um, just curious for yours. So you you did um, your egg retrieval, mm-hmm. correct? And then in the lab, they then used your husband's sperm mm-hmm. and you created your embryos. Yes. You did the genetic testing. Obviously, all of that came back and then they scored your embryos mm-hmm. and then they froze them. Yes. And then you were then come because like, then it shifts now for us to another person because then we have our egg donors right. separate from our surrogate. And so then you have to go in for what is like a transfer day or mm-hmm. impl- the implant. The yeah, the transfer day. And then I'm very curious because off camera before we sat down, you actually did something our surrogate did, mm-hmm. which was a mock trial, a mock mock transfer. Yeah, mock transfer. So essentially, my understanding, I want you to tell it in a much cleaner way. I just know she had to take more hormones mm-hmm. and supplements and try to like trick the embryo or the body to thinking it was ready to transfer, ready to transfer. So can you walk me through what that is? Yes. So my situation was a little different because we were good to go. It was transfer day. We did a transfer and it failed. Mm. So we used one of our frozen embryos and things were looking really good. Everything was just, my doctor was like, your uterine lining's perfect. Everything's looking great. I was just so confident. Um, and it just didn't work. So two weeks later we took pregnancy tests and like we were thinking that was the moment, you know, and I'm like filming it and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe our lives are about to change. And then you just see like me flip it over and I'm like, it didn't work. And I'm just like sobbing and I I just like can't even believe it. And so that was really, really hard. Um, Can I ask what, and you don't have to share this if you don't want to, what was the grade of the embryo that you transferred? It was the best you can get. I think it was like, uh, what, oh gosh, five AA or six yeah. AA. It was like the, high, the, one highest, the highest one. Yeah. My doctor was like, it's the highest one. And all our embryos were luckily, um, pretty high graded, but that was like the, yeah. you know, so I was just like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this did not work. Yep. Will it ever work? Like it just, it just crushed us because we were like, we thought that that was the moment. And I think we really just, you know, I guess naively we're, we're just very positive and kind of banking on that. So anyway that happened and then we had a call with my doctor and he was like I'm so sorry I know that's I know how disappointing this is I would really recommend now you do a mock transfer because I don't know why that didn't work because your embryo was amazing quality you are healthy your uterine lining was great everything was looking really good and so um what that mock transfer does in our case was it basically So the next cycle of like your period and whatever, Mm -hmm. you start taking all the same medication, doing all the shots in your stomach as if you were about to transfer an embryo. So you're doing that for weeks, prepping for it. And then instead of putting the embryo into you like a transfer, they go in there and they take a sample of your uterine lining and they send it off for testing to see if you are receptive in that moment. Mm. So because um, typically maybe every doctor's different, but 
Um, if you have like a five day frozen embryo or whatever, you do a certain amount of shots leading up to the transfer. And then it's yep. like, okay, this is the perfect timing to put the embryo in. Yep. But some people are something called pre-receptive or they can be post-receptive and you could be off by like 24 hours. And so he's like, I think that that could have happened. Let's do a, a mock transfer and see if your uterine lining was receptive at the time that we did it. The reason we didn't do it at the beginning. Yeah is because we had a good amount of embryos and just everything looked good. Um, I think some people do that mock transfer. It's called also called an ERA test. That's yeah. what it was called for me at least. Um, if they have only like, you know, a few embryos and they're like, well, we want a few kids or whatever. And they're like, yep. we don't have any to waste. Right. Not that I you want to ever waste any embryos. period. But um, anyway, so we did that, that transfer, or that mock trial thing. And it came back that I was pretty receptive. Which was and they needed to do it earlier. So it's actually weird. It's later, but oh, it's, it's like opposite. an extra. Yeah, it's an extra twenty four hours of shots, and then you put it in. Okay. So again, even though I was like kind of frustrated that we just you know wasted an embryo and we just went through all that, it was again comforting to get information yep. and to have an answer to something. And he was like, "Well." let's do another transfer next month and let's do it 24 hours later than we would have planned. Yeah. And that's the one that took. So it's, that's incredible. Yeah. And I'm so happy. Like data and science yes. is so important in this and so such important. a precise thing. I just remember when I first, they were like, we got to, we have to do this now. And I was like another month delay. Oh, I know. Tell and me it, about it. it's just like, you know, we're going on two years now from the day we looked at each other and we're like, we need to yeah. like start our family. And then all of a sudden you get this email and you're like, okay, but now we're doing a mock trial. And I was like, great. What does that mean? It's like another 30 to 50 days and depending on when the period is. So it's definitely IVF and for this fertility journey specifically, you have to be patient. So patient. That's something that I was just talking to Leif, my husband about. I was like, I feel like I have become, I have had no choice but to become so much more patient. It's yeah. always been a personality trait of mine to be impatient. I'm always like, yes. I want what I want right now. I've always been a very like, Same. oh, I have this idea. Same. I want it. I, I'm doing it tomorrow. And, yeah. and, you know, and to have to wait literally four years for something, it's like, yeah. okay, I have no choice. But I think that that's an amazing thing that you gain by going through something really challenging like IVF is you grow a lot as a person. And I feel like, it prepares you for parenthood. Yeah. Like, you know, I feel like one of probably the most important traits to have while being, when being a parent is being patient. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I've had to learn a lot of patience the past few years and I feel like that will help me, you know? Totally. Outside of patience, what's the other biggest thing you've learned throughout these last four years? I think oh one, one thing too, while you're thinking of that answer that I just want to point out that's really impressive and, and cool that I think you did was you sort of just took a step back for two years. And you're like, wait, like this is not in the best interest of my life right now. I mean, that's a form of patience too. Like I've never seen because having that self-awareness of like, this is a lot. I just need to remove myself from the situation for a hot sec and then come back to plan my family. It's, that's pretty cool. Thank you. I, I, I'm proud of myself for doing that because I do think sometimes when you're going through something like this, it's easy to just like push, push, push harder. Like you're yeah. just get more and more stressed. And it's like, we just need this to happen now. And I yeah. was just like, I yeah. need to like let go. When you ask what else I've learned, I feel like the letting go and the not comparing your life to other people is like number one priority because, um, we talked a little bit off camera. Like I got married when I was super young. I grew up, um, Mormon LDS and it's very common to get married immediately and yeah. have kids immediately. Yep. And you know, my husband, I'd been married for eight years and people are always just like, when are you having kids? Like, yeah. Yeah. and, um, I've just learned like everyone is just on their own journey. And, and it's also just so, um, it's interesting how your environment just shapes your perspective and how I was saying I would be on a trip to New York and it's like, I'm with my friends who are in their early thirties. They're not even thinking about getting married anytime soon. Right. And it would, you know, hit me that I'm like, I need to, I need to have a kid. I need to have a kid. And it's like, everyone just lives such a different life. You really can't get caught up in like yeah. everyone else's story. You just have to be proud of your own story and just going through your own thing and like really listening to your intuition and what feels good in the moment. And it's different for everyone. For sure. And I think that the different for everyone thing 
it's definitely made me more self-aware now because I feel like not that there's anything wrong with it. I think people just don't know. It is such an invasive question when people are like, when are you having kids? Because like it gets thrown around so loosely and casually when like you just said for your, for two years of your life, I mean, four total, you were eating, sleeping, like everything was to get pregnant and for your fertility and it still was not working out for someone to so loosely come up and be like, why aren't you have kids yet? It's like, uh, it's such an insensitive question at times that we just don't know as a society when, how, and when we go about it. I know. I'm always trying to say that on my podcast. I'm like, you guys, if you learn one thing from just my experience, like, please don't ask people when they're having kids. Yeah. Please don't ask people if they're pregnant. Please don't. I would always get messages like, I can just tell you're pregnant. And I'm like, I'm not pregnant, girl. <laughs> like it was back in, the, yeah. I'm like, I'm bloated from fertility treatments, <laughs> right. but I'm not pregnant. And right. please don't assume that. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm always just shocked by that still to this day. I just think it's, you have no idea what anyone's going through. You don't know what they have gone through, sure. what they might. And it's just like, just, they can have kids when they want and they will let you know and they will be so excited to tell you, I'm yes. sure. Let them tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go back to the grass is greener thing because mm-hmm. I, I found that interesting too. And especially just like on my coming out journey and just, I always loved I always loved like finding my identity in other things and people because I didn't want to confront my own identity of being a gay man. And I think some people do that in different ways, not just because they're closeted or their sexuality, just in other insecurities and other things that they carry shame about in their life and how they live their life. So talk to me a little bit about your journey with social media. I mean, obviously you've had tremendous success and you've had high, high moments and probably I'm assuming with comments and DMs that aren't great, low moments. How do you balance that? What does that look like? How do you remove yourself as a human being or how do you humanize that social media aspect of this? Oh my gosh, it's such a journey. I feel like I've had such an interesting just lifespan with social media because I really have never known a life without it. Literally ever since I was 18, I've been doing social yeah. media. Yeah. And that's actually something fertility aside. Like I've been thinking a lot about that. Probably when I hit like 26, I was like, who am I? What am I like? Where do I get my identity? Where do I get my self-worth? Where do I, I have people constantly giving me validation, yeah. but I also have people constantly critiquing me. And, um, that's not necessarily a normal thing to be experiencing from the time you're 17 or 18 years old until you're almost 30 to be constantly both good and bad like right. people being obsessed with you people be hating you and just having this very volatile relationship with it but I feel like the older I get the more I've learned like you can't I guess find your identity within that and you also like you can't listen too much to the good or the bad yeah. I would always like, I would look at my podcast reviews and when they were good, I was like, oh, yeah, like this is awesome. And then there would be one that's like, JC needs to, blah, blah, blah. and I'd be like, I just have the worst day. Like, yeah. oh my gosh. And it kind of hit me. I'm like, if I'm putting so much weight into the positive of people being like, you're so awesome. You're so this, like, if that's what I believe about myself, then when they come and they say something else, totally, it's going to hit me just as hard. And I have to, again, I think this was probably a few years ago. I just had this moment where I was like, I have to find like the peace and the identity within myself. I need to, and that's, it goes a lot along with like my faith journey with, there's so many elements to it, but it all kind of actually deeply correlates and coincides with my fertility journey as well. Yeah, It's all layered. Like I don't even know how to get into it because it's just all I want to get into this because I had to navigate my faith journey with coming out and also now through my family. I mean, yeah. As you know, like faith, I mean, religion has its beliefs on fertility and on the journey of mothers and fathers. And most people would tell you like what we're doing isn't totally acceptable. And I obviously am now at peace with my faith and my views and my relationship with God and like where I'm at in my life. But did you face any of that through this? Oh my gosh, so much. Like as you were talking, I was just like. This is such a thing. My friend um, has a like post-Mormon podcast and she just, we haven't recorded it yet, but we're going to record an episode all about infertility and like faith journeys and Mormonism because it's, I'm like, it so deeply coincides. I feel like 
my entire life, it was pounded into my head, this very specific view and ideal of motherhood. And it was very like, that is your role as a woman Mm. is to be a mother and to like have kids young and to get started. And then when you can't have, when you you can't get pregnant, it's like, okay. And you're still a part of that. It's like, okay, so where do I lay? You know, where do I fall into this whole plan of being the perfect mom when I can't get pregnant? And then you have people, I would always get comments on social media or from other people like, well, if it's not working out, then that there's a reason. Like if you can't get pregnant, it's because wow. you're not meant to be a mom. It's because you guys aren't so. ready to be parents. Yet all my best friends are having their second kids, you know, and I'm like, so am I just like a broken person who I don't deserve to be a mom because like I can't. Yeah. And logically, I know there was like scientific <laughs> reasons for things, but it's it's all just weaves in together and makes it really, really difficult. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. It's just so inconsiderate when people just, uh, I mean, trust me, I've heard, heard that Oh, I'm before. sure you've heard a lot. Yeah. One, I had somebody in my life when I first told them what we were doing with a straight face, so serious, was just like, so which one of you is going to be the mom and which one of you is going to be the dad? I was like, mm, I don't know what you're trying to ask here, but we're both men. We're going to be two dads. I was like, are you asking which one's going to take on more of like the maternal roles? Like, are we getting into right. like social norms here? So it just like loaded, like, but it just shows you too, like some people are so rooted in like what they view mm-hmm. that they're just so unaware of like what they're actually saying. Well, and, and, and if you don't, if you've never had to go through something like that, like, yeah. you know, if I'd have women in my life or whatever, people that I went to church with just be able to get pregnant the first time they tried every time. And they're just kind of like, Oh, must not be meant to be, you know? And it's like, girl, we are not the same. Like we, you have no idea. Also so lazy (laughs) to jump to that conclusion. Like if if that's where your mind goes and like, that's what comes out of your mouth, like lazy. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I thought you meant lazy of them to just try once and get, I'm like, true. Oh no, 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 (laughs) not that, not that. But yes, (laughs) get back on that horse. Um, I just meant like, it's just such a lazy response in someone's head to like, let that come out of their mouth to be like, Oh, then I guess it's not meant to be. It's like, you didn't even think of the hundred other things that could be going on in that person's life that you just so inconsiderately jumped to this conclusion. Glazed over for sure. And I think, um, yeah, just kind of when I hit that point, like I said, was probably 25, 26, I don't remember. I had like this moment of just like, again, who am I? What do I believe in? Where do I get my worth? Who, where do I get my identity? What do I think about all of this? Do I actually believe that I'm like a broken person who shouldn't be a mom? And I came to the conclusion. Absolutely not. Like good for you. It. And so I feel like that did give me the power to be like, I'm not doing IVF right now. I need a second. I want to like figure all this out. And I, and I was just talking to my husband about how like I am so glad. I feel like I was in a very chaotic like mentality when we were trying to get pregnant and I was very, it was very pushy. Like I just, cause a lot of my friends are having kids yep. and then I took that time that I needed and I'm like, I will be a way better mom now. I really believe that. I mean, I could have worked it out before, but like, I really feel like I understand way more of who I am and what I want and the type of mother that I want to be now. And mm-hmm. I feel so much more confident. I feel like if it would have worked, you know, again, yeah. hindsight's twenty twenty, And that's a whole other thing is like God's timing. Like people are always like, again, like it wasn't meant to happen. And I'm like, you know, maybe there is yeah. something to that. But I think that's reserved for the person going through the trial to say and not you. <laughs> Amen to that. That's why I have 2911 on my wrist. And it's like trust in the Lord's plans that yeah. he has for you, plans to prosper and not to harm you. And I think like that's always, always been something that's always been is like everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, I... I don't talk about it very often, but like I obviously ended up on a show that was so straight and I was like, I had to go through that in order to come out. And then I had to come out and do what I did. If I wouldn't have come out as public, you know, I wouldn't have met my husband at the party, the party that I threw with the network afterwards. And then all of like, all of these dominoes fell for a reason. And it led me to the life that I'm living now. I'm proud. And, and like, of course I could have, and if I would go back, I could have done things differently and better, but like, it had to happen for the reason. Definitely. And I feel like, again, that's for, I I think that's for you yourself to recognize. And like, I think the reason I'm saying that is because sometimes like in the midst of going through fertility stuff, people be like, oh, well, you know, like it must not be the right timing or like just wait. And I'm like, that's easy for you to say when you're not going through something. But again, I can now look back and be like, 
I'm happy with this timing. Totally. And I think that's amazing that we can come to those conclusions on our own, but maybe not being yeah. bombarded with that, you know? For sure. Well, all right. So all of this, let's shift to more of a positive, happy note. Okay, so he- here's, <laughs> here's what I want to know. So you, you had that first test, obviously did not get the results you wanted. What was that moment like? Cause I'm assuming you had, you had the cameras up. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. And you were filming it and you flip it over and you see a positive test. Yeah. What was going through your mind? Talk to me about that. Oh my gosh. I had said before, I was like, I probably won't even cry because I will be so in shock. Like if it is positive, if there ever comes a day when I see a positive pregnancy test, I just feel like I will be like speechless. But the second I saw, I just started sobbing. I was like, oh my gosh. Like in the video, I like can't even talk. I'm just like, I can't believe it. I was so, so, so happy. Um, but something that people, not to go back to a negative, but something that a lot of people don't talk about is like the almost anxiety of it working because then it's like, okay, now I'm pregnant. Like now, you know, when I go for the ultrasound, is everything going to be okay? Like, is there going to be a heartbeat? And there's all these like milestones you kind of have to hit. And so I was in bliss for definitely a few days. I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. But then once the doctor called, I was like, okay, this number needs to, to double and we'll see in a few days. And I was like, oh wait, I'm scared now. Like, what if it doesn't double? I was just so... Wait, scared of that can we break. talk, can we talk about, cause this is similar to our journey. Can we talk about how black and white doctors are like how zero, they do not hold your hand when they break news to you. They're very clinical. They're very number data driven. It's in look, I love my doctor. I love the <laughs> fertility place that I'm at right now. It is a little scientific where you're just like, oh, what did you, what you just told me? I needed you to hold my hand and give me a hug. Uh, I wonder if we have the same doctor because he, (laughs) my doctor is very like kind of blunt and yeah, he definitely wasn't holding any hands, which I picked him for like, he's very just brilliant and I really liked him. Um, but yeah, he wasn't one to like, even when, um, we got the call that we were pregnant, like I went in for the blood test and I was like, I'm so excited to have that moment where they're like, you're pregnant. And everyone's like, yay. And he called. He's like, all right. He's like, well, it is positive. We're not out of the woods though. Like we, and I was like, immediately immediately went into like, like, he's like, the number needs to double. And I was just like, oh my gosh, now I'm like terrified. I'm not, I almost can't even be excited. And then he, he's like, it'll probably all be fine. It'll probably all be fine. I'm like, probably I've waited four years for this. And then two days later, he's like, yep, great news. And I'm like, okay, you're terrifying. So I'm not out of the woods yet either. I have to like, level my expectations for our clinic and our doctor of like even breaking good well, or bad Well, maybe news not though cuz every doctor is so different. Yeah. And it usually again usually is great news. It's just yeah, like yeah, yeah. sometimes I think they probably don't want to They have get a job your, to do though yes, too. Yes. Yes. They probably don't want to be so certain and then heaven forbid like yeah. the number doesn't double and they have to give I don't know. So but yeah, I was like I just, You know it's interesting that my doctor said to me that I didn't really think of until he said it. But he goes, "What's what most people don't understand is you come in and you are my patient. Your egg donor comes in. She is my patient. The surrogate mm-hmm. comes in. She is my patient. I have three patients to service to the best of their abilities for their individual needs. And of course, like I'm working for you and like your journey is not physical in this other, other than collecting our sample. But like it really hit me. I was like, oh yeah, like they're doing a medical procedure on both of these women who that is their doctor at that moment. Right. So, and then you don't really like, it just becomes one of those things where I'm like, okay, I'm signing this contract. Like, this and is I'm my journey. I'm going person, through and yeah, and this is my journey. Yeah. But like individually there's three other people, four, if you include my husband with ours, like four people on this journey. And then our team of lawyers and doctors and, it's like, it's totally. a lot that people don't, don't quite understand. No. And I don't even think, obviously I can't even understand that depth of that too. Like the numerous patients and everything. I mean, our journeys are just different, but yeah, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah. It's insane. Okay. So, cause I want to know, cause I, I'm going to need some advice once we go through this and I get to the point where I have news to share. How did you decide when you were going to post it? Did you do it right away? Did you hold off and delay? Did you tell friends and family? Because one thing that I've navigated with my family that's been a little tricky is like their beef with me is like, (laughs) they're like, here's our rule from here on out. We don't want to learn anything new about you on TV. (laughs) So like you have to tell us. And I was like, that is very fair. Okay, I get it. Like they're like, don't go on Ellen and like share something that like is so exciting and you didn't even tell us yet. So my Nana um, and my aunts, that's like our our deal now. Um, 
So how did you go about sharing this this amazing news with your family and friends? I shared pretty early on. Um, so our first transfer, I was hush hush. I did not tell anyone that we were transferring because I was so excited to like surprise them. Yeah. People knew we were in the midst of doing IVF, but they didn't know the specifics of the day of the transfer or any of that. So I was really hush hush about it. But after that failed and I was just so depressed, frankly, I was like, I think it might help to tell a few people in my life that I'm transferring and they can actually be there for me next time. So I, I had told my parents and a few of my best friends that we were going to transfer. So they, they knew kind of the timeline. So I did share with those people pretty early on that the transfer was successful. Um, once I confirmed with a few little appointments, um, and it was just the best happiest moments ever. Um, but I didn't share on social media until I was into my second trimester of my pregnancy. Got it. And I, um, I actually thought I would share earlier, but it just kept, honestly, frankly, I was just very sick. It's my first trimester. I literally had no like energy or motivation to do anything. So I was like, Oh, I want to share. I want to share. But I was just like, I got to wait until I feel a little better. And then it was just kept dragging on anyway. Um, which I think there's a lot of different perspectives on like when to share. And I Mm -hmm. think it's totally up to the person who's pregnant the person who wants to share the news, whatever. Um, because I do think that every baby deserves to be celebrated. I think that no matter how early you are in your pregnancy, I completely understand and have experienced that anxiety of like, is it going to work out? Is this going to be okay? And again, if you're not comfortable sharing, I don't think you have to, or you should, but you're also allowed to. I think that you can share whenever yeah. you're ready. And for me, I just waited till I felt comfortable. And that was yeah, yeah. my second trimester. See, we made the mistake of telling people when we were doing our transfer. So then mm. now like we have people asking. Like and, waiting. And we don't. Yeah. And like, obviously, like we don't really we want to keep this. <laughs> we're almost like, how do we put this back in the can? You're like, actually, we didn't um, transfer. Uh, yeah. And actually, <laughs> yeah, we're like, so about that. I was like. It's longer, taking longer than expected. I was like, how long can we just like keep telling them it's taking longer than expected? Like we just aren't ready to like talk about what happened yet. And like we're that's like the whole navigating this. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be people calling me out being like, your timeline doesn't make sense. I'm like, good. You're like, I know. (laughs) That's on purpose. That's intentional. (laughs) Um, I'll share news with you when I have it Um, and when I want to. Yes. Um, It's so tricky. It is. It is. And it can add stress to you when. Yeah. Like it can add unneeded stress sometimes when it's like people are, when did it work? Did it happen? And you're just like, yeah. can you like, I'm stressed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, like, do you, are you guys working through like game planning now for nursery? I know you're doing a home renovation. Yes. So like working on nursery, preparing your game plan. Cause I know like once you're in that second trimester, you have to start working for like your hospital plan and all of that. It's wild. There's we are. so much planning. Yeah, there is so. Oh my gosh, it's it's so wild how just uh, Leif the other day we were laying in bed. He's like, "So what do we do when we like bring the baby home? Like, what do we do then?" And I'm like, yeah. "I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know anything. We have a lot to prepare. We we're gonna do some like courses and some things. We have yeah. some things planned. Yep. Um, but yeah, we're kind of just in. We just ordered a stroller. We've just been ordering some stuff like. Sh- just the home renovation honestly is kind of like, I don't think it's going to be ready in time, which is the worst. Oh, wow. It was supposed to be, but I just don't yeah, think it yeah. will. I'm trying not to bank on that. Cause got I'm it, like, I just it, don't want to yeah. get my expectations. So we're like, okay, we need to set up a little, just like a little nursery setup in our current rental house and got then it. we can move it. But yeah, we're working on the nursery, we're working on a lot of different stuff right now. We have a lot that we're juggling, but it's, it's very, very exciting. That has to be bonding for the two of you as well. It is. Can you talk a little bit about how this has impacted your relationship and, you know, the dynamics and how it's shifted and changed? Oh, man. I feel like it's made us really a lot stronger. I really do. I think that infertility is so, so hard and it can affect so many aspects of your life, especially like you said, when you're like living, breathing, sleeping, doing this thing. And it it can impact like I mean, maybe TMI, but the whole episode's been TMI. You know, there are times when it's like, okay, don't have sex for the, oh, these two Oh, they tell you that weeks. during that. Well, like, yeah, stuff we like heard that. that as well for our surrogate because we were curious too. We're like, oh, yeah, they can't. Well, and also for biological reasons, like they right. can't have sex leading up to the transfer. Yeah. Got it. So there's a lot of things like that with, and you know, when you do so many fertility treatments, it's like, okay, don't have sex for these three weeks. Okay, then you're good. Then you don't. And it's just, it like, 
I don't want to say it messes with your relationship, but it makes things more less like well, romantic and, and yeah. it's just like very medical and you're just going through this process. And I can't imagine it, you feel, I don't mean this directed towards you and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but like shooting all of these hormones into your stomach and feeling bloated, like you can't feel your sexiest at all the times of like a normal <laughs> relationship. Not at all. Just tons of different things that can impact. Um, and, and I'm saying that all as like, a preface to say, but in the end, I feel like it has yeah. made us so much stronger. And like, again, I feel so, I always knew Leif would be an amazing dad, but like going through this, I'm like, oh yeah, you're going to be just the best because of how much you've taken care of me. And I, I'm very lucky to have a partner who has been just very aware of, very, very self-aware and very aware of me. Like he understands that I'm going through a lot. Yeah. And so he is just so helpful and so great and it really has just like made me love him so much more and I feel like now going into parenthood we kind of talked off camera for a second I was saying how IVF like strips you of so much normalcy and I I always remember thinking like you know we have to go about this like this medical way whereas like other people can just have sex and like get pregnant it's like made from their love and like for us it's just like oh go into the doctor's office and yeah. do all these shots and like it seemed less uh, yeah, like romantic or like beautiful. And I think going through this process, I've realized like how much love there is mm. and how much dedication, if you're going through IVF, if, you know, I mean, it's very expensive. So if you have the privilege of, of even being able to totally. do it, it's like you do gain something that I think maybe other people don't have. And it's like this intense, you obviously are not going through this unless you really want a baby and you really want to start a family. And yeah. I think that that's, the most love ever. I agree with you. And I, I've, I've had these conversations with Jordan and, and just because like, you know, I've heard it all at this point of like pushback and people who don't know. And like, this is one of the most intentional things you can do in your life. And that intentional family building and practice in our family. And it sounds like in yours too, is rooted in love. Like I love Jordan so much that I, I can't wait to watch him be a dad and our family is going to be rooted in love. So like I would, I get what you're saying totally. Cause I trust me, I've felt like those emotions too. But at the end of the day, I'm like, this is what makes our journey special. It's like, while it is sort of test tubes and clinic visits and all of these like medical things going on, our love and our, how intentional the money we're put like, all of that. You're sacrificing so You're much. You're sacrificing so much. Like we're working this year just to hopefully pay and contribute to building our family. 100%. And, and I, I like, I know that's so privileged to even say, but like that, like that is bonding in itself too of like, not only are we family planning, we're financial planning. We're doing all of these different things in our lives to be able to have a kid. And, and we're willing to do it together. Right, and right. we're working together on this like project essentially. That's, that means so much to us. And it's, yeah. it's really beautiful. I think like I had those fears going into IVF, like, oh, it's just going to feel so medical. And am I going to, when I get pregnant, you know, I was asking Leif, I'm like, do you feel like you got me pregnant? He's like, yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about, you know, <laughs> we're like, yeah, kind of. But it's like, I was just worried about so many little things. Like, is he yeah. going to feel, obviously it's his kid, but I'm just saying like, because of the medical nature, are we going to yeah. feel so like connected to this pregnancy? And like, absolutely. I feel like maybe even more than than I would have if I just was able to get totally. pregnant like that. Like just feel so, so happy, so grateful. And like, it's just been such a long time coming, you know? Yeah. Jordan's going to kill me for saying this, but we, we wanted to connect while the transfer was happening. So we, yeah, we were cuddling up in our bed when <laughs> that's all I'll say. I'll let you guys use your imagination, but we wanted it to feel, I yeah. don't know. There was some weird thing that we were like, we need to be having sex while the transfer is happening to like, I don't, that, it made us feel better. But, and that was like what we wanted to go do. That's, yeah, it's Because like some people attend moment. the um, transfer. So most couples actually go with their surrogate to the transfer. And we were mm. like, we want to give her a privacy. This is really invasive anyway. We'll just go connect and do our own yeah. thing. So yeah, it was just like everybody has their own way to handle this and go about it. And also validate our emotions. Totally. Just, that, I felt like that was uh, the best thing for us. Yeah, I love that. And I feel like that's what is so cool about everyone's different fertility journey and doing IVF is that there's so many little, I don't know. I feel like there's also so many little times to celebrate. Like yeah. 
Yeah. Any good news we got, we're like, let's go to the beach. It's like, we're just so happy yeah. that for any, I don't know. So there's a lot of really special moments throughout it. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious on how you're handling this. Names. Let's talk <laughs> about it because everybody has a freaking opinion. Are we sticking with letters? Do you have like specific, is there any like traditions in your family? Is there any strategy and also, are you not asking people for advice for names? Because I've already been overwhelmed with this. Oh, I'm not asking a soul for their opinion, Smart. number one. <laughs> Smart. Don't give me your opinion. I don't care. Um, no, I don't really have any traditions or like family things, um, honestly. So my mom's middle name is Marie and my middle name is Marie. And then my husband's, I think he has the same middle name as his dad. And it's Steven. And I'm like no like and also <laughs> <Poor Stevens>. yeah, <laughs> I'm just like there's nothing about that it doesn't I don't know I'm also not the most like sentimental nostalgic person I will say that so got maybe it, that's why I don't feel as connected but even yeah people will be like oh are you gonna give them this middle name or this middle name and I'm like I don't know like I'll just do what sounds like it's cute. A name. <laughs> I'm like it's yeah. I'll just do what sounds cute with the name I don't know totally. so um are you on that side of TikTok where you get a lot of baby name? Like, do you get on TikTok ever and yes. see baby name? I feel like a foreigner videos? on TikTok. So this is what. I, yes, <laughs> let me ask you your advice on this because I'm. I feel too old for TikTok right now. No, no, you are not. Old. Okay, well, I'm gonna just start doing my own thing, and like, if people want to follow me on TikTok, great. I I tried the dancing and the transition videos, and like, it <laughs> felt so all? forced and Didn't awkward. We all? I'm no, just I got start bullied. I actually was like a dancer. So I'm like not a bad dancer, but yeah. I was dancing like a little too seriously in 2020. Got it. And I would, people would be like, this is so cringy. You're I love like, how humble you are. You're like a little too seriously. <laughs> no, but they, they were like making fun of me and me and my friend would be like, that is so, you know, they're unhappy with themselves, whatever. And like three years later, I'm like, sometimes bullying is necessary. And you guys were right. <laughs> like that was cringy. Uh, that was giving You cringy. got bullied out of the dance community <laughs> of TikTok. Yeah. So we, we've all been there with the 2020 dances. Okay, okay, yeah. got it, got it, got it. Um, you just gotta find your own lane. But yes, uh, the algorithm and the data listens to me. I've been, yes, there's been lots of baby content popping up on my feed. Names, I mean, I, obviously our family members have opinions, opinions on that. It's so, it's so Initials, much. initials. Mm -hmm. We, so legally Jordan and I didn't change our last names when we got married, but our kids will have our hyphenated last names okay cool. that's cool so we're already sort of thinking of like first middle and then be you it is hard to, to make it all flow i will say like yes. i'll be like oh that's a cute name and then i'll think of it with the la right. my last name and i'm like mm, that's not giving yeah. what it needs to give right so um i just have a long like do you have a list of baby names i just have a long list that i add to we do and they're all the same letter oh really yeah oh we that's kind of cute boy and girl options all in the same letter i love that yeah um that makes it a, like that's intentional, I'm assuming. Or you just Very. happen to like a lot of the same and then you're like, we okay. actually have, I shouldn't say that. We have one letter that's like super, super long. And then we have another letter that we like too. That's like okay. a fraction of that. Um, I don't know. Like my family did that. I'm like, so Colton and Connor, Connor's my brother. Uh -huh. And we have Trenton and Tyler. And then we have Hayden Harper Hadley. Like our Hold family. Hold on. Those are all your siblings? Cousins. Oh, okay. so like, I'm but like, that's sort of so like many. in our family vein. Yeah, we have a lot of like little weird quirks, and I don't, okay. know, I don't know if we're if Jordan and I are going to keep that alive, but like we really are honed in onto this one letter right okay. now. Okay, no, we're, I like that. Really honestly, it. it's intentional. It's cute. Yeah. I feel like I don't have any traditions like that, but I just have a long list of names, and it was really weird actually. The second I actually got pregnant, my like some of my top names, I was like, no, no. I don't know why, but mm. it's been like there was this one name that I was like. That's the one, like, for years. And then the second I got pregnant, I was like, I don't know why. It's yeah. just not it. Well, and also I think until the baby is in this world, yeah, y you have to, like, look in its eyes and be like, you are a, and then the totally. name. And just And, like, because, I mean, look, like, even, like, the Kardashians and Jenners have to change their baby names. Exactly. Because they didn't fit it. I know. People are brave who share their baby name before. They'll be like, this is what we're naming. I'm like, wow, that's bold. It's like, what if he doesn't, yeah. he or she doesn't yeah. look like what that? Yeah, what if you like right. look at the child and you're like, never mind. Yeah, Once totally. it comes, you know, whatever, you can change it. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for being so open, not only on your channels, but here too. Like it's it's a breath of fresh air and it's, mo it's much needed in our world. And I can't thank you enough for sharing your platform, sharing your story, sharing your life with everybody. It's super helpful. Thank you so much for having me and I'm so excited for you and I can't Thank wait you. for hopefully amazing news and yes. I will just be rooting for you guys. Thank you. Before you go, can you please leave us with some advice? It could be learned recently or 
four years ago when you first started this. Leave us with some knowledge and some advice. Oh, gosh. You know what I heard? So I'm obviously like I, I'm not a parent yet, but I heard some advice on a podcast a few years ago that like stuck with me. And it sounds so simple. This is a girl talking about being a parent. OK, yeah, but it it stuck with me because she was saying like. I forget the verbiage, but essentially the idea is like the only thing you have to be to be a good parent is you, is yourself. And I, the reason that sticks out to me is because I kind of, as we've talked about like the identity thing and like the faith thing, I always felt like I had to go outside of myself to become like, you know, maybe I'm not a good enough, maybe I won't be patient enough to be a mom. Maybe I won't be mm. like nurturing enough to be a mom or something. And all these things, I always felt like I had to before I got pregnant or when I got pregnant, okay, now I got to find all the ways to be a good mom. Yep. And I think recently I'm just realizing like, literally I just have to be the happiest, healthiest version of myself. And that will extend into my relationship with my husband where we will be this like loving unit for our kid. Um, that will be what makes me a great mom is just literally being happy, confident, healthy, and listening to my intuition and doing me. And I think that's a really good reminder that we don't have to go outside of ourselves for really much of anything to just be who we're meant to be. Amen. That is so beautiful. Be you. You are enough. I love you're that. You're going to be a great mom. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And you're going to be an amazing dad. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, this is daddyhood. Thank you guys. And until next time. And that was my dog. Timing. Woo. The ride of your life is daddyhood.